Hello again. Tonight we're going to talk about liquid nitrogen. May seem like an oddball topic for an astronomy group to talk about liquid nitrogen, but trust me, there are some connections. This was actually a member requested uh, presentation. There was fascination with the process by which you get liquid nitrogen. So we'll talk about that. So what she really wanted us to do was talk about how liquid nitrogen gets produced and the various uses for it. I've had this sort of in the pipeline for a few weeks, and I just Late, uh, earlier today, got this uh, presentation done and sent it out with the weekly mail. So we'll talk about how nitrogen is separated from other gases and liquids, the temperature reduction and compression used to form liquid nitrogen, how it's stored, transported, and then the uh, industrial uses of it. If you're not familiar with it, nitrogen is an element in the periodic table of elements. It's element number seven. That means it has seven protons and neutrons and electrons unless it's a radioactive isotope of it. It is colorless, odorless. It is a diatomic gas at room temperature and pressure, which means you don't get just an atom of nitrogen hanging out. It likes to hang out in pairs. So it's usually diatomic as in two. So you'll see it when it's a gas noted as N subscript two, kind of like oxygen is diatomic, you see O2. It is an asphyxiant gas, which means it can displace oxygen. So if you have air in a room and then you pump in an abundance of nitrogen, there won't be any more oxygen in the room to breathe because it will be shoved out because the oxygen falls lower and goes out the bottom. It is the seventh most abundant element in the solar system and in the Milky Way galaxy. When we look out into space and we look at uh, nebula, we can actually see the excited nitrogen gas in the nebula by spectral analysis. Nitrogen uh, in the presence of hydrogen and oxygen will readily bond, and you will get um, compounds that uh, are typically somewhat volatile. Think of it as uh, you go to your dentist and you say, I don't want Novocaine, I don't want epinephrine, I want gas. What does he give you? Nitrous oxide. Yeah, so nitrous oxide stops certain chemical reactions in your body, so you, you get dozed off and don't feel anything. And then if you stop receiving it, you come back. But if you receive too much of it, um, you may never come back. As I said, it's an asphyxiant gas. So when you bond it with uh, oxygen, you get nitrous oxide. Um, it's not like giving you pure nitrogen. So nitrogen is abundant in the atmosphere. 78.08% of the Earth's atmosphere that you breathe is nitrogen. Uh, just less than 21% is oxygen. So when you go, I'm breathing oxygen. A very small part of the atmosphere is actually oxygen. There are certain environments like uh, incubators and such where the level of oxygen gets close to pure oxygen. If you're in a hospital and you've got nasal tubes, that's pure oxygen coming out of the wall, coming out of a main cylinder system at the hospital. So uh, yeah, when you're just breathing air, you talk about the oxygen you're breathing, 78% of what you're breathing is nitrogen. And also there's argon and carbon dioxide and some more rare earth uh, gases that are in very, very small quantities. If you want the nitrogen, you want it pure, you're gonna have to separate all that junk gas stuff out. So you may go to your car dealer or your tire repair center and they say, would you like nitrogen in your tires? And your response should be, no thanks, I already have close to 80% nitrogen in my tires by putting air in them. Oh, but you don't understand the oxygen and air oxidizes the rubber in your tires and they don't last as long. Oh, can, can you tell me like how many more miles or how many more years my tires will last if I let you put nitrogen in them? Um, longer, trust us, longer. Oh, why is that? Well, because there's still air on the outside of the tires and that can uh, ox you know, oxidize the rubber on the outside of your tires. But if nitrogen is so abundant, why is there an extra fee for nitrogen in my tires? It costs them money to separate all that nitrogen from all the other gases. So if you want to produce pure high-grade nitrogen without all the other pollutants in it, um, you have to go through an industrial process. It's not the kind of thing that you can just, you know, I'll, I'll run it through a filter, a cheap filter, like a coffee filter, and I'll get just the nitrogen out. Uh, not quite, not quite. Um, there's three major ways in which you can take air and get out reasonably pure nitrogen. There's something called pressure swing abs adsorption, not absorption, but adsorption. 
and that will get you 99 to 99.9995% pure nitrogen, but it's expensive. Then there's something called membrane filtering. So if you want to give up a little bit of the purity and get it to 95 to 99.5, you can have a series of tubes and you pump the air under pressure down through the tubes and the outer, the, the interior out, uh, the interior wall of the tubes is lined with a nanoscale filter, kind of a, a synthetic filter. And what happens is the nitrogen as N2 is bigger than the O2 and the argon and the CO2. So they get squeezed out to the side and the nitrogen flows through the center of the tube on the inside of the filter. Those filters can get clogged with all the other stuff. And so they don't, you know, you have to replace them and maintain them. But the the big bulk production of nitrogen as a gas, pure gas, as well as cryogenic nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, comes from um, fractional distillation. And when I say fractional distillation, your first thought might be gasoline. And yeah, this is similar, but instead of you um, making a vapor out of the nitrogen, what you're doing is you filter out the particulates, you filter out water, and then you heat it to filter out the water vapor, and then you run it through rapid, extensive refrigeration, like enormous air conditioning units, and it drops the temperature of the nitrogen to the point where you no longer have particulates in it, you no longer have water or water vapor in it, so now all you've got is the basic gases, argon, nitrogen, and um, oxygen. But you can see here that these all become liquid at different temperatures. Argon falls out first as, well, it'll go liquid at a slightly warmer temperature than liquid nitrogen. So if you're running your refrigeration and you bring it down to a certain stage, the argon will liquefy and come out the bottom. Meanwhile, the nitrogen and the oxygen are still gaseous, even though really cold, they're still gaseous inside of your tank, your, your tower. But you drop the temperature down further, and now the argon's gone, the nitrogen becomes liquefied, but the oxygen is not yet liquefied. It's super cold, but it's not yet liquefied. So this is how you get to your 100% pure nitrogen is You've gotten rid of the argon. You've filtered out the particulates, the water vapor, and the CO2. So the only thing that's left is the liquid nitrogen and the very cold oxygen. And you take out your nitrogen, and now you can separate out the oxygen, and you can further reduce its temperature to produce liquid oxygen. So you can see the fractional distillation is more a matter of fractional refrigeration, and you extracting what goes liquid first, and then dropping the temperature down further take out the next liquid, and then drop the temperature down further. The purified cold oxygen can be made into liquid oxygen separately and sold either as pure oxygen to hospitals, but hospitals will buy liquid oxygen and then warm it up to make the oxygen they use in their air system. Uh, and then the argon is used in uh, welding and purification of chambers, you know, purging and stuff. And then the liquid nitrogen is separated out and stored into large pressurized tanks. And if you zoom up here, you'll see that these three different heights of tanks, one of them is going to be argon. That's the one that came out first. That's the shorty tank. And the oxygen is the one that takes the most effort. It's the tallest tank. And then the tank in the middle is the liquid nitrogen. So if you ever drive past a industrial facility, you see the Mo, Larry, and Curly of tanks. It's like argon, nitrogen, oxygen. And then the large nondescript rectangle, that's the refrigeration tower. And I zoomed in on that uh, N2 tank. So when you release liquid nitrogen into air and it expands from the heat, it'll expand one to 694 times, which is considerable, but it's less than oxygen, less than helium, and less than hydrogen. So it's a manageable expansion. So they can actually make tanks it will keep its pressure, keep its cool, so to speak, without having to do what oxygen and hydrogen do, which is constantly venting. Because if you didn't vent liquid, hyd liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, the tank would rupture because you can't make a tank strong enough to hold their rate of expansion. 
So you can conveniently store nitrogen in liquid form at industrial plants, on tank trucks to transport it to places. There's a lovely company right here in Fort Lauderdale called Air Gas. If you need a lot of liquid nitrogen, just give them a call, pay the money. They'll be glad to deliver it. So we can build tanks that will hold liquid nitrogen. But if we went to do that with uh, other liquefied gases, not only would they not be able to hold the pressure and have to be vented, but here's something interesting people don't know about is the seals for liquid hydrogen and liquid helium are not perfect. You can compress them as much as you like, but they're going to leak. And if you remember last year, there were a couple of times when they went to uh, launch a particular non-SpaceX brand of rocket, and they had hydrogen leaks. And their first response was, go tighten the bolts tighter, because the coupling from the ground to the rocket, you think of the, it must be a rubber gasket in there. No, no, no. When you get to liquid, liquid hydrogen, liquid helium, there's no rubber that can take that. It's literally a precisely flat piece of metal compressed under high pressure with another piece of metal. And that's the actual junction. That's the seal is just a big flat piece of metal. Now, if you have a microscopic defect in that surface and you don't detect it, or you get some debris in there and you don't clean it out, or even some water that gets stuck in there, you will not be able to compress the two pieces of metal tight enough and you'll have a leak. But since nitrogen is so much bigger, further in the periodic table of elements, heavier, um, you can use you know reasonable priced gaskets to hold it in place. You don't need these, these types of seals. And the odd thing is that this is weird. Hydrogen, smaller atom than helium, but helium can actually leak around welds. So you, 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 know, you do a weld for your tank, you take the tank base and the tank sidewall, and you make a lovely weld to hold the two of them together. And then you do x-ray analysis to make sure that there's no defects. You fill that sucker up with liquid helium. And even if it's not venting, the liquid helium is leaking out. So over time, you paid to have your tank filled, and now your tank is leaking out all by itself. It's the nature of liquid helium. So if you're a small business and you need liquid nitrogen, you can call up air gas and order a tanker delivery. Um, you can have a tank that's on site, a little tank or a bigger tank. Uh, you can you know, use it at, at your leisure, so to speak. It's not going to go anywhere. And the other thing is the little gray thing down the bottom there, that's called a doer. And it's a think of it as a vacuum thermos only much bigger. And it has a, a vacuum inner liner that keeps the heat from coming outside in and inside out. So you can put your liquid nitrogen in a doer and then come back later, open the top, open the seal and pour out liquid nitrogen. Now, once you have your liquid nitrogen, what, what are you, you going to use it for? MRI machines use liquid nitrogen to keep their liquid helium cold. So the superconducting magnets and the MRI machine, the magnetic resonance imaging machine, they stay cold and superconductivity exists because they're refrigerated with liquid helium. But if you just had liquid helium directly, the outside heat would actually heat up the helium and that would be a problem. It would leak out, it might rupture, and you don't want that when you've got sick people trying to get images. So what they do is you have the superconducting magnets, you have liquid helium on the outside of the coils, and then you have liquid nitrogen on the outside of that to keep the liquid helium cold. And also you can use nitrogen gas, not so much liquid nitrogen, but nitrogen gas to purge things. You go buy yourself a pair of binoculars and you'll read on the package, nitrogen purged. Well, all, all that means is in order to get the moisture and any oxygen out of your binoculars, Somewhere in the factory, there's a pressure chamber, and the pressure chamber is filled with nitrogen gas under pressure, and that pushes all of the water vapor and the oxygen out of your binoculars, and then they seal them up so that you can take your binoculars out somewhere where the temperature changes rapidly, and your lenses won't fog over or get wet. You can't do that with large telescopes because they leak like a sieve. They're just, you know, bolted together metal. But, you know, you have... Um, thick plastic screw threads and gaskets. And you can do that with your binoculars or even eyepieces. You can buy a, a Nagler multi-stack, very expensive eyepiece 
and you'll find that originally they were nitrogen purged. But nitrogen, as I pointed out, is reactive. However, argon is not. And that argon that you brought out as a uh, liquid argon, you can use that for purging of your optical devices and charge a little more cha-ching for them. And um, you can state them as being argon cured, not that, not that nitrogen stuff, argon. I found this one to be interesting. When you want to make a, uh, a gas-fired furnace for making molten metals, you can seal it off and purge the furnace with nitrogen, which reduces the oxygen inside the furnace until you want to inject it into the process. So you can make your metal more oxygen-free by purging your furnace with nitrogen under pressure. And in order to have that much nitrogen under that much pressure, it'd be nice to have a tank out back with liquid nitrogen. In it. And you might have seen this on uh, certain tests of rockets. Um, the fuel and oxidizer tanks, you need to make sure they're going to be able to take the pressure of the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, liquefied methane. So what you do, rather than wasting these precious valuable fuels, is you put your tank up on the stand, and then you dump a lot of liquid nitrogen into it as if it was your liquid cryogenic fuel, and then you pressurize it. And you want to see, will it take it? But the first one you build, you don't want to see if it will take it. You want to see what it will take to make it go bang, explode, rip itself open. So the first model of any new rocket or tank for fuel or oxidizer, you'll see them take it beyond its limit into a destructive state because then they can back that number down by 10% and say, as long as we keep the pressure below that, we're good. So pressurization testing for the tanks you want, for the rocket tanks you want to keep, and the design limit testing for the ones that you want to know how bad can it get. Another one that I found interesting, and I don't know if uh, this occurs in the uh, soft drink bottles that uh, I drink from, um, the two liter bottles, but uh, I found that there's a company that actually uses liquid nitrogen to strengthen the plastic of the bottles so they can make the bottles thinner. You know how when you, when you um, freeze something with liquid nitrogen, all the molecules move closer together. But when you do that with a polymer, once you heat it back up, unless you heat it above a certain level, all the molecules retain that closeness and makes the bottle stronger with less plastic in it. So you can stack the bottles higher and you don't need a frame. You can actually stack, you can put a frame on the base and you don't need a frame on the tops of the bottles. You can just stack the next pallet up on top of it and the bottles won't like bulge out and, and fall apart. So it saves them the cost of the plastic pallet on the tops of the bottles. Is that really that much? Well, yeah, when you're, when you're shipping millions of bottles of soft drink every year, not having to produce one more piece of plastic for every pallet that you ship must be a lot of money. Or to quote um, Elon Musk, the best part is no part. And also for those people that are into it, have you ever tried nitrogen ice cream? There are stores you can go to, you know, uh, an ice cream shop that will have liquid nitrogen in tanks there. And what they'll do is they'll dispense a certain volume of liquid nitrogen into the mixer while they're mixing up the ingredients for your ice cream. Normally a dairy product will form like fatty protein kind of stuff in it and it will make your ice cream runny uh, when it starts to melt it'll, it'll the the cream part of it won't separate as fast as the water will and so your ice cream will drip but there won't be a lot of ice cream in the drips it'll be mostly water well if you use liquid nitrogen in there it crystallizes the material before the water can have a chance to separate out from the, the fatter uh, materials and so Vegan nitrogen ice cream is really good because instead of it leaking out and getting all messy, it'll stay solid longer because it's crystalline. It's not just a frozen liquid. And it also makes it taste much smoother because your tongue doesn't notice the crystals. But uh, if you ever have an opportunity and you see a nitrogen ice cream shop, go ahead and give it a try. And if you're vegan, yep, ask for the vegan. They have it vegan. So in conclusion... Nitrogen, it's a gas. It's the diatomic gas N2. It's abundant and it's dominant in the atmosphere. Once you separate it out from all the other pollutant gases and liquids, it's very usable for a lot of different things. 
the best way to transport it and store it is as a cryogenic liquid. It takes up one, you know, almost one seven hundredth the space as it does as it just a, a, a gas in the atmosphere. And it's useful for a variety of different things, either as a pure gas or as a cryogenic liquid. And some links. I didn't put put the one in there for the nitrogen ice cream store. I'll let you find that one. I knew it was going to be brief. I was it was requested, so I had to do it. Comments, questions. I find the uh, presentation cold. <laughs> <laughs> yes, most people say I am a bit cold when I'm discussing scientific topics. <laughs> There's a nitrogen ice cream store in the uh, Home Depot Plaza just south of 595 on university i tried it once tasted like regular ice cream but i yeah. didn't hold it long enough to watch it melt or not melt yeah well we uh when helen and i visit the one we go to the one in weston usually and um get it vegan we didn't know i mean we, we went there a couple of times beforehand when we weren't vegan and never thought about it but then we came in there after <laughs> being vegan saying uh, it's a dairy product <laughs> Do we get like gelato and have them freeze gelato? And no, no, no. There are um, alternatives for vegans. Cool, but you yeah, could use coconut milk and probably nut milks. Yes, right? the soy milk and things, oat milk. And yeah, there's a bunch of different things they can freeze up. But all the ingredients, you know, the the fruits and nuts and stuff like that, those are all the same things. Well, that, that sounds like an affordable alternative to uh, a vegan uh, restaurant, which we found out last week was about eight hundred dollars a person. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't eight hundred dollars a person. It was only like sixty dollars a person. <laughs> Still outrageous. Uh, so now, is there other foods that they inject nitrogen in? I mean, I don't know about the food group for this nitrogen. Well, um, yes, but they don't inject it into the food. If you go buy a bag of chips, a snack bag of chips, mm -hmm. and you see that the bag is puffy as opposed to squished down, the gas they use in there is nitrogen because if they use CO2, it would react with the contents and stay up, make them stale. But if they use pure nitrogen, it won't oxidize. So if you get a bag of chips and the bag is kind of puffy, they do that for two reasons. One is the chips will last longer. The pretzels will last longer because there's no oxygen to oxidize them to make them stale. But the second reason is if you puff up the bag and then you throw a bunch of bags into a bigger bag, it's less likely that you'll be breaking up the individual snack food, like chips and stuff. So the chips come out of the bag being more whole chips. They last longer, which are both good for the supply inventory management of Frito-Lay. Well, this ice cream though, you were saying they injected it into the ice cream. Yes, well, they, they don't inject it in the ice cream. What they do is, um, if you've ever seen in industrial kitchens making mashed potatoes, they have a giant aluminum vat, and then they have a big mixing blade that goes in there and stirs around. That's what they do. They put your ingredients into the mixing bowl, and then they have a valve that they open up, and it dumps liquid nitrogen into the vat and then they turn on the blender and it stirs up your ingredients with the liquid nitrogen and makes the contents crystalline and then when they get done they take a scoop and they scoop it out and put it in your cone or your your cup yeah but it doesn't <laughs> sound like the white chef said that it's mixing it into the food that i'm about to eat and i don't know about anything else that i eat that it's actually mixed into even with the potato chips you're saying that that's like um, on the outside, the air instead of, and it dissipates. I mean, it's not going with the food into your mouth. It's a you, means are of you quick are, breathing, you concern, right? are you concerned about toxicity of nitrogen? What did that, my, Diane say? I said it's a means of very, very, very quick freezing of the yeah. ingredients. It's not like you're consuming a whole bunch of nitrogen. It's just a, a means of freezing it. But are you consuming some? Yes. Okay. Well, but would it be any more than just regular ice cream where as you're mixing it, some air gets mixed into okay. it? I, I, given that air is 80% nitrogen, yeah, I would not at all be concerned about the toxicity of nitrogen because <laughs> inhale, you just took in 80% of that air as nitrogen and your body <laughs> has no problem with it. Now, 
if you have nitrogen in your scuba tank and you go below a certain depth, when you come back up, you need to come back up slowly because the nitrogen uh -huh. gets diffused into the liquids of your bloodstream. And as you come back up, remember the pressure ratio of nitrogen about 700 times. It wants to foam or bubble out of your of the uh, blood serum, uh, not the blood cells, but the actual liquids in your blood. And you don't want that happening in your very small arteries. So, you know, you consuming nitrogen, it's normal. It happens. You consuming liquid nitrogen is like, hey, my ice cream is cold. But as you consume it, it warms up and the nitrogen gets evaporated. So I wouldn't worry about it. What they did have to worry about at the nitrogen ice cream place in Weston is you got to make sure you don't put the pretty tank of liquid nitrogen in the front window where the sun can be on it in the afternoon. <laughs> because it expands about 700 to 1. So uh, Does the place in Weston also have pipes going up the around the ceiling and oh, yeah. down the walls? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, it's cool looking, very industrial. Yeah. They, orig they originally had the liquid nitrogen tank right in the front window of the store, and <laughs> the store faces west. <laughs> Not a good idea, because no. you only have to heat up the glass to make the heat transfer to the tank, and if you don't have the appropriate valve system to bleed it off when it comes becomes too hot, um, they had a leak, and the store floor filled up with liquid nitrogen. It's like a fog gas on the floor. And they had to ask everybody to leave because remember, it's an asphyxiant. And if they had the yeah. gas filled up too deep, shorter people like children would have no air to breathe. So, okay, we've got a leak. Everybody get out of the store. And once they got people out, the pressure continued to build. And the, the tank didn't explode. What exploded was the plumbing and the shock force of the expansion blew out the front window of the store. The glass window of the store. Wow. So they had the company that provides, they had the company that comes in and provides them with the liquid nitrogen, redo all the plumbing. It's now in the back of the building. It's not in the front window anymore, in shade. And they've got pressure relief valves that go out the top of the building. I remember about 20 years ago, I was in Texas. It might be 40 years ago. Well, anyway, it was a long time ago uh, when this first came out the liquid nitrogen ice cream. Yep. And I, I remember it being sold in the kiosks, like at the mall, like in the yep. middle of the mall, they'd have it. Get a little doer and, of it, and, yeah. And at the time, I don't know if they make it the same way they did then. I did not particularly care for it. It was like little pebbles that they put into a little cup and they were little pieces of ice cream, but it did not, it, it was the crystal, it was like. Yes, that that's. That's kind of an inferior way of doing it. Um, okay. if, you, if you're at a kiosk in a shopping mall, um, you can't have all the appropriate equipment for a large container of liquid nitrogen and the appropriate valves for discharging it. All you have is one of those doer cans and you scoop in and then you pour out the liquid nitrogen on it and then you just hand it to someone. You might stir it with a metal spoon, but that's it. Well, when you go to the nitrogen ice cream store, they have the appropriate tanks and valves and stuff like that. And they also have the industrial mixers to make sure it all gets blended smoothly. Yeah, I get that when they first started it. I don't know if you remember, but they it was one of the first that I remember, like Subway, where you would be able to buy your own company and uh, be in charge of this nitrogen ice, ice cream that was a new concept coming out. Not a lot of people could afford a big, big ice cream store, yep. but that, that this was going to, um, they were saying like you could go into a space was going to eat ice cream this way. That's how yes. they had ice cream. Freeze dried ice cream. Um, yeah. Because if you want, if, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, one of the things you can use uh, cryogenically cooled nitrogen for is removing heat from things, freeze drying. So yeah, you can freeze dry ice cream without it being a liquid, you can desiccate all of the liquid out of it. So it's just crunchy. And then you add water to it and it kind of, kind of becomes ice cream again. <laughs> yeah, kind of. So that was my one experience with it. And I did not think that this was actually food when I ate it. And I said, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do this again for a while. That's I'd, I'd say if you find a nitrogen ice cream store and you see that they have lots of plumbing and mixers and stuff, you might try it again. Yeah. 
Um, so here's here's an interesting, if, if you remember the old James Burke Connection show, here's an interesting thing. The kiosks that would offer you the freeze-dried ice cream got displaced by dipping dots. You know, the ice oh, cream yes, with the yes. dipping dots on? Well, yes. that displaced them. And okay, so now dipping dots is the big thing you add to your ice cream. Right. Dipping dots during the economic recession prior to the pandemic um, almost went out of business because they had no stores. Nobody wanted to buy stuff. And then the pandemic came in and drove them down further. But the one thing Dipping Dots had in its favor is they had a high volume manufacturing process for making uniformly small things. And a company said, how small can you make those? They said, how small do you need them? Can you make them a few hundred nanometers across? Uh, okay. Quantum Dot Television. <clears throat> The company that makes quantum dots in red, green, and blue, because they're they're exactly the same material. They're just made, you know, um, 700 nanometers, 555 nanometers, and 450 nanometers. Blue, green, red. And when you shine a white LED through it, but kind of a misnomer saying it's a white LED, you shine a very bright white light through it, depending upon how many of which dots received the white light will present to you color images mixed up red, green, and blue. So the company that's behind dipping dots is affiliated with the company that produces the quantum dots for quantum, for QLED, Q.TV. Wow. Connections. <laughs> okay. Any comments or questions before I stop recording? Hearing nothing.